So we are now recording, Dawn, so I will hand over to you. Welcome everybody to the Fast Flag webinar on source code components in corporate software. It's co-hosted with Source Code Control. I'm Dawn Osborne, Chair of Flag. We have two speakers today, Martin and Holly from Source Code Control, who will introduce themselves in detail prior to speaking. We're expecting to run for about an hour with time for questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and the, and the speakers will take them at the end of their talks. We are recording this session and we will be sharing the recording and the slides from the presentations in a follow up email with a feedback form. Uh, and also it will have the email addresses and contact details of me and the speakers. Um, and so if you want to contact us afterwards, you'll be able to do that or to provide a number if you want to call from any of us. Uh, we do have some guests today who are not Fast Flag members. Obviously, we are a membership organization. If you want to find out more about the benefits of Fast, if you're a corporate, or flag if you're from a law firm, please go to fast.org. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to our speakers. Thanks a lot, Dawn. Welcome everybody to this presentation. Um, as Dawn said, there's two presenters today, myself and a colleague of mine, Holly. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I just want to uh, qualify some general misunderstandings about what we're going to talk about. So there's going to be a lot of talk about open source. And when, when we're referring to open source, we're not referring to solutions that badge themselves as open source and promote themselves as open source. We're talking about uh, any general software developments. So IoT, uh, cloud solutions, embedded devices, which developers will use uh, third party components to build this, the solution. Now, we, we do a lot of um, audit work for investors and for legal firms. And predominantly, uh, the companies that are the target for an investment are oblivious to the amount of open source that's in their, their code. Because they're oblivious to it, they don't manage it. So what we're going to, going to be talking about in this presentation is, first of all, Holly's going to go through what are those risks? Are they really a risk and should they be taken seriously? The second part of the presentation, I'll talk about, well, how do people manage this and how can you validate that the company is managing this? So um, in a moment, I'll hand over to Holly, who will do the first part of the presentation. Um, before I do that, just a quick introduction uh, to myself. So I've been around the software industry for far too long. I've worked for and with Alex Hilton, actually, um, and did a lot of work around compliance related to proprietary software. In recent years, we've been fully focused on compliance related to open source, and I, we'll talk about that further in the presentation. Holly, do you want to introduce yourself and kick off the presentation? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Martin. So, hello, everyone. I'm Holly. I'm a governance specialist at Source Code Control. So, in contrast to Martin, my background is not technology. Um, I'm a law graduate from the University of Sheffield, and I graduated in 2020. And um, found myself in the role at Source Code Control following an interest in copyright and related rights, and wanted to see, um, look at the copyright regime and um, work in a specialised area. So um, my role, I work with open source licences, interpretation of licences, and I also assist Martin in our due diligence project. So a little bit about source code control. We have established, source code control has established itself as one of the only open source consultancy businesses. We have offices across the globe in the UK, the US, Poland, and India. We help organizations that have software at the core of their company value build trust in supply chains. With this in mind, our main aim is to minimize an organization's risk when dealing with open source. Um, services we offer include training programs to help participants understand the risks and pitfalls of open source and um, educate around the practices to manage these risks. We offer a range of end-to-end -end services to identify open source software and its associated risks and help organizations make informed decisions when managing open source software. This includes software bill of material production and investor readiness reports. 
So as um, Martin said, I'll take the first half of this presentation talking about the legal risks and security issues impacting an organisation's software IP in relation to open source software. And then Mar I'll hand over to Martin, who will discuss latest industry standards and how their implementation can mitigate, manage and control these issues. So firstly, what is open source software? Martin touched on this briefly um, in the intro. Developers share and contribute the source code of libraries, components and frameworks on code sharing sites such as NPM and GitHub. And um, these are released under what is known as an open source license. So open source software is freely available code that can be reused by other developers on other projects. This means they do not have to repetitive, repetitively code common functionality from scratch. This is a huge benefit as it reduces time, um, the time to deliver a solution to market and at a lower cost. So developers use open source because of these benefits, however, are often unaware of the license obligations as those open source components which unknowingly to them exposes their organization and its intellectual property to risks, which may be costly and time consuming to resolve. The reality is that modern applications such as mobile, cloud, web, and internet of things connected devices may comprise of up to 90% of open source code. In our experience, when performing audits for investors and software companies, our clients are often extremely surprised to discover the extent of open source components discovered in their applications. And as a result, in today's digital age, the question isn't whether there is any open source software being used in a company's products, but how is open source being used and what licenses are governing its use? So I'm going to talk a bit more about open source licenses. The capacity of a third party to use and exercise rights over the software depends on the terms of the open source license granted by the copyright owner. You can think of open source licenses falling on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you have the permissive licenses, which present a low level of commercial risk. This is because they do not obligate you to share code and non-compliance can be easily rectified. Generally, these licenses allow you to modify and distribute the code, but you must provide attribution and copyright notices. Examples include the MIT license and the Apache 2.0 license. And at the other end of the spectrum, the more restrictive copyleft licenses present a higher level of commercial risk because of their obligations to share source code and to license modified or derivative works under the same copyleft license. The obligation to share code may be undesirable for organizations that hold value in their intellectual property as this act could significantly diminish or even eliminate the product's commercial viability. Additionally, the obligation to reciprocate the license often creates license conflicts where organizations license their modified works under another license, such as a proprietary end user license agreement or another open source license. Um, something to point out here in the end column that we'll talk a bit more about later is source available licenses. But these are proprietary licenses, they're not open source, but they cause a lot of confusion in developer space because they are mistaken for open source licenses. So the problems arise when developers are unaware of the license obligations attached to the open source components they are consuming into their organization's products. As clients will determine the level of risk they are willing to assume, it is all about advising on what is an acceptable level of risk for them. For example, are permissive licenses an acceptable risk to assume? Is that organization, um, does that organization have no worries with sharing their source code? So are copyleft licenses an acceptable, acceptable risk to assume? On the previous slide, I referenced a developer's lack of understanding open source obligations may expose organizations to, and its IP to risks. I'm going, over the next few slides, I'm going to talk about these risks in a bit more detail and give some examples. Firstly, copyright infringement. Generally, open source components have individual copyright holders, which may be significant organizations. For example, Microsoft is the largest open source contributor on GitHub. So as a result, enforcement in this space is increasingly driven by companies and motivated by commercial drivers such as lost revenue or competitive advantage. 
Secondly, bad publicity. Naturally, IP violations and legal proceedings expose an organisation to bad publicity. This has potential to create damaging effects for the organisation. Thirdly, the infringing organisation may be vilified by the community. So many members of the open source community are very passionate about upholding the obligations of open source licences. They generally aren't interested in financial compensation. It's more about keeping software open. If they see organisations quoting code but not meeting the obligations of the licences, they create a lot of no noise and this negative publicity is then used to drive enforcement. And finally, company value. In an M&A or investment scenario, the presence of unmanaged open source components in the target software presents a risk, therefore may devalue the company. In our experience, we have seen that if software contains a large quantity of open source software that is not consistently tracked, acquires of delayed decisions and in some cases change the terms and conditions of the deal. So we are asked, often asked at Source Code Control, are rights actually enforced? The most prevalent and high profile enforcement is pursuing of the general public license, the GPL, which is a copyleft license. This license requires any derivative works to be licensed under the same GPL license and you must share or make an offer to share the entire source code to your software, the derivative work. There are two organisations who have become the sort of custodians of the open source definition. Um, these are the Free Software Foundation and the Open Source Initiative. The Open Source Initiative has also become an approving body for open source licences. As I mentioned in the previous slide, enforcement in this space is increasingly driven by companies. However, where right holders do not have the resources um, support can be sought from organisations such as the Software Freedom Conservancy and the Software Freedom Law Centre. Both organisations help and protect defend open source software projects from licence violations. Both the SFC and the SFLC actively work to defend right holders by seeking out copyleft licence violations, which you will see in some of the example, um, examples I've got to follow. A high profile example of GPL enforcement was between Artifact Software and Siemens in 2019. So in an effort to monetize open source, the dual licensing model emerged. This model offers free use of software under a copyleft license like the GPL, or a commercial license can be purchased to take away the obligation to share your source code, your IP. Artifacts uses such a model for their GoScript software. This is a PDF interpreting suite and they are increasingly using their dual licensing model as a tactic to drive revenue. Artifacts actively pursue organisations who neither share their code or have a commercial license. The quote on the screen here from their president, Miles Jones, is in relation to the legal action that Artifacts took against, took against Siemens. Artifacts offers a straightforward choice, comply with the AGPL, sign our commercial license, or do not distribute, distribute GhostScript. We take our obligation to protect your intellectual property seriously. Siemens allegedly used GhostScript in their product Sol Solid Edge over 10 years ago. This was discovered when a customer raised a support issue regarding GhostScript. Artifacts sued for copyright infringement. Siemens settled outside of court just over a year later. When it comes to dual licensing, the issue is that too often developers will believe software is free to use because that company has a reputation for open source software development. When license violations are discovered, an organization may be forced to pay the commercial license fees or they need to find an alternative and re-engineer the entire product. And if non-compliance proceeds, a claim may be made. Second example, in the US on the 19th of October, so just over two weeks ago, the Software Freedom Conservancy filed proceedings against a smart TV manufacturer, Visio, alleging a failure to comply with the copyleft license CPL version 2. The SFC alleges that over the last four years, Visio have distributed smart TVs that included smart cast code, which they allege contains modified GPL code associated with the Linux kernel open source project. The SFC asserts that Visio did not release the corresponding source code or accompany their smart TVs with a written offer to supply such code on demand, which is required by the GPL license. This complaint does not seek monetary damages, but seeks specific performance. 
this being for Visio to make an offer for the complete source code of the product. Because their non-compliance denies rights, that should be guaranteed to the downstream users. And what differentiates this case from the claims that the SFC have made in the past is the fact that the Software Freedom Conservancy is not suing on behalf of the copyright holder of a particular open source component. Instead, the claim is made as a consumer of Visio's products. If the plaintiff is successful, the case could have the effect of expanding enforcement of GPL licenses under the rubric of consumer protection and allow a broad range of parties to bring claims under the GPL as third party beneficiaries of those licenses. So this example encompasses all the organisational impacts stated on the previous slide and highlights the importance of compliance. At source code control, we're often asked, who is actually enforcing their rights? How will they know we are not compliant? Well, both of these examples show that enforcement is a reality. And in particular, this video example demonstrates that it may not be initiated by the right holders themselves. So enforcement by the community is another risk. Many members of the open source community are deeply invested in respecting the public software commons and driving collaborative innovation. Therefore, organisations may be subject to vilification for their infringing acts by the open source community, if not by the right holders themselves to force license compliance. Example, in January 2016, Jide Technology announced the launch of its crowdfunded project Remix operating system for PC. Initially, Jide refused to share the source code for their Remix operating system on the grounds it, we're, not an org, we're not an open source organisation, therefore we don't open source that code. However, users created a lot of noise online after discovering when running the installer, there was a clear reference to the GPL component. Reporters picked up on the license violation, which forced Jide to release their source code four days later. Jide is a relatively small development company that heavily relied on investment. The last thing they likely needed was negative PR, as well as being forced to share the IP to a major new product. Their lack of software management left them with no other choice but to share their source code. And less than two years later, Jai discontinued Remix OS to focus on a more profitable enterprise market. Another example um, of enforcement by the community, which involves Tesla, who use GPL license components in their autopilot systems. Tesla initially refused to make an offer for their source code. As you can imagine, they were incredibly reluctant to do so as it may expose their intellectual property and reduce their competitive advantage. And as a result, they received a lot of heat in the media from the open source community. This then escalated to the Software Freedom Conservancy who provided legal support to increase pressure on Tesla to comply with the GPL. Consequently, in 2018, Tesla was forced to make the source code for their autopilot system public avail publicly available. However, it is a note that Tesla are only partially complying. This battle is yet not yet won. Um, they have failed to um, supply the complete corresponding source code to the software in question. So open source in technical due diligence and its effects in mergers and acquisitions. In an M&A or investment scenario, in our experience, we have seen that if software contains a large quantity of open source software that is not consistently tracked, acquirers have delayed decisions and in some cases changed the terms and conditions of the deal. I can say that there has not been one due diligence project we have worked on that has not been delayed or in some way affected following our findings. In the context of open source software compliance, copyleft licenses generally present the most risk to an acquiring organisation. This is because of the obligation to share source code. Post deal, if a copyleft violation is discovered, the acquiring organisation has the choice of releasing the entire source code to the software under the same copyleft license, removing those copyleft components, which requires re-engineering of the entire product, or to pull the product from the market altogether. Any of these consequences, understandably, may be undesirable. To illustrate, in 2008, when Cisco, the multinational technology conglomerate, acquired the networking company Linksys for $500 million post-deal, 
Cisco discovered that some of LinkedIn's software products contained UPL licensed components. The Free Software Foundation brought a copyright infringement action against Cisco for the violation of the license. And after reviewing its options, Cisco believed that it would be cost prohibitive to re-engineer the code and instead entered into a settlement agreement in which Cisco agreed to release the formerly proprietary source code to the product under the GPL license. This meant that individuals or organizations could now modify or um, modify a run-of-the-mill router and enable premium features from the source code that Cisco released. And as a result, Cisco was prevented from gener generating licensing revenue from the software products it acquired from Linksys. Like proprietary software, open source software is a source of vulnerabilities and security risks. Therefore, we are seeing a bigger focus on security in, technical, in the technical due diligence process. In most cases, there is already a fix to vulnerable components before a breach materializes. However, if an organization is not tracking security vulnerabilities in their code, it is irrelevant if there is a fix or not. Um, the 2018 British Airways cyber attack demonstrates this. The security breach compromised the sensitive data of over 400,000 of their customers, resulting in an initial 183 million GDPR fine due to the breach of Article 32. Um, but this cyber attack, cyber attack was caused by a well-known security vulnerability in one single component, which had not been updated since 2012. British Airways received such a large fine because they had the power to avoid this breach, but due to their lack of software management, it materialised. Another example, when the ITO announced its intention to fine Marriott 99 million for GDPR violations after a highly publicised data breach, this highlighted the importance of due diligence in cybersecurity in the context of mergers and acquisitions. This fine was first proposed was the first proposed regulatory action to specifically call out a company for alleged inadequate cyber due diligence in connection with an M&A deal. The breach originated in a system belonging to the Starwood Hotels Group, which Marriott had acquired in 2016. The relevant Starwood systems were compromised in 2014, but the exposure of customer data was only discovered in 2018. By that point, the breach is said to have affected 30 million people within the European economic area. The global estimate is that 339 million individuals were affected. Both the Cisco and Marriott examples come as a reminder of the importance of technical due diligence in the context of mergers and acquisitions, um, especially if the target company is a technology company, as the software may well be the principal asset. So I'm coming towards the end of my section and at the start when we I discussed the licenses, I referenced source available licenses, which often create a lot of confusion among developers. Um, so in our, what we have seen over the past year is a lot of open source license changes for products, software products to source available licenses. And these tend to be in cloud technologies. There is a correlation with source available licenses in cloud tech. There is a lot of investment going on in this space at the moment, and more and more organizations are moving to the cloud because of COVID-19. So if the software is licensed under an open source license, this means organizations can take that software, use and modify it possibly to provide a service and make profit without infringing the copyright of the open source project. And to stop this, open source projects are changing licenses to source available. This is a license which looks like open source, but at some point it restricts important freedoms that the open source definition protects. An example is the server-side public license, which was created by the American software company MongoDB. This allows for code to be used, modified and distributed, but derivative works must be licensed under the server-side public license. This is very similar to the GPL, however, where it restricts rights is because if the code is used as part of a service, you must share the entire source code for your service, which is directly contrary to the open source definition, which requires you must be able to use co code for any field of endeavor. Earlier this year, Elasticsearch 
changed its dual licensing model for its Elasticsearch and Cabana products. From the Apache 2.0 license and their commercial license to the server-side public license and their commercial license. This left service providers using the Apache 2.0 versions with the option to share source code or pay for the commercial license or re-engineer and take out those components. And because of this, AWS have forked the, the old Apache version of Elasticsearch. This means AWS have recreated a new version based on the old Elastic version without infringing the copyright um, as the open source definition allows, which this means possibly if um, the licensing model was changed so that users, um, in users providing a service, if they were um, if they did not want to buy the if they did were providing a service they'd have to buy the commercial license um, now it seems that all these users instead of doing buying the commercial license they can go to aws and use their um, fault version which is licensed under the apache 2.0 license we have found the service side public license in the last 10 audits we have performed and all of those organizations were unaware of this license thing Therefore, this is something we always caution to investors as it highlights the need for continuous monitoring to ensure continuous compliance. The reality is the nature of modern software development means one day an organization may be compliant and the next they may not be. So to round up before I hand over to Martin, the question as to whether open source software is in an organization software product is no longer a reality. These days, the focus is on what open source is in my software and am I compliant with these licenses? With regards to risk management, clients need to determine what level of risk they are willing to assume, specifically which licenses are an acceptable risk. Enforcement of open source licenses is a possibility. As demonstrated in examples, this is not confined to a large, well-known um, organization. Therefore, compliance could be met, not only to um, manage and mitigate the organizational impacts, but also as a be best practice. License compliance demonstrates the quality in your code and the quality in your product. And finally, due diligence against open source in, M &A, in an M&A context is important, especially if the target is a software company. Um, therefore, it's re it is important if they are a software company that technical due diligence is added to that due, due diligence list of tasks. Security risks will likely become a growing focus. There will never be a contingency fund big enough to support the ICO fines against BA and Marriott. Therefore, it should be taken seriously. And with that, I'll pass over to you, Martin, to talk about the management of these risks. Thanks, Holly. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, flip over to my presentation. It's also worth saying a recent case. A, re a recent case has involved Donald Trump. So you may, you may have read Donald Trump has launched a social media platform and the developers of that platform basically took a load of code off a open source social media platform called Mastodon, which is licensed under the AGPL. And they got 30 days to either share the source code of the platform or they, they need to remove the Mastodon code. And obviously Donald Trump is very high profile. So you, so you get a lot of noise about that. So, so Holly's talked about a lot of the risks and, and referenced some of the findings when we're doing due diligence. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things we hear when we're, we're, we're talking to tech companies uh, around this uh, subject is things like we don't use open source, we develop on Microsoft, um, it's a niche subject, we don't need to manage it, it's not important, um, what's, what's the chance of getting caught? Obviously Holly's giving you some examples there. Um, if, I go, if I go back so to two or three years, um, it used to be very difficult um to engage with customers because they didn't think it was something they should take seriously because of all the legal cases and security cases holly's touched on and there, there are far more we, we, do, we do track all the cases um obviously we haven't got enough time to go through all of them but what's happened in the past two years has been an increase in regulation across the world forcing companies to manage this 
So I'd say two years ago, uh, it's a case of companies should manage uh, open source compliance and security. The world's changed to you have to do that. So there's an increasing re regulation. So I'm just going to skip through some some examples of these. And there's, there's a common theme to the re regulations. And it's, it's really about um, software suppliers, whether it's cloud solutions, you know, software as a service, or you're delivering a software solution, is about transparency about the use of third party code, particularly from a security perspective, but also from a compliance perspective. So across the world and across industry verticals, we are seeing mandates on software companies to demonstrate control of open source in their code. And the, the common theme that we're seeing is for companies to supply what's known as a software bill of materials with the software they're delivering to customers. So software bill of materials is basically an inventory of all the components, version numbers, other security vulnerabilities, license and copyright information associated with the third party code in their code. Uh, you could think of it like the ingredients list on food packaging. Um, but it's, as, as I said, it's been forced, it's been forced in different industries. So I highly touched on the British, British Airways fine. Uh, in, in GDPR, there's uh, Article 32, and it states, you know, ensure a level of security appropriate to risk. Now, in the in the British Airways example, they had a component called Modernizer. It's 100 lines of code. It's very small components. Uh, it's broadly used by developers, and as Holly stated, it hadn't been updated since 2012, and it was a vulnerability in that component that enabled hackers to get into their network and siphon off all their data. So clearly they didn't have a level of security appropriate to risk, which was reflected in the initial fine, which was later later reduced. So GDPR is relevant to tracking open source components, etc. Recently, um, the, uh, the White House in, in the US, so the new Biden administration, uh, the US infrastructure has had repeated attempts at hacks from state actors like China and, and Russia. So they've implemented a, an executive order, which has now been passed into law about a week ago, uh, about improving the nation's cyber security. And in that executive order and in the now uh, uh, bill that's been passed as a legal requirement for public sector in, in the US, any software supplier supplying solutions, whether it's cloud, whether it's on-premise software, have to provide a detailed software bill of materials with the, the software that they're supplying. Like I said, it's analogous to food packaging. It includes the need to identify the component names, versions, dependencies, the license associated with it. So IP is, is part of that. Um, so if you want to study the act, there's, there's a link in the, in the slide, but it's the Department of Homeland Security Software Supply Chain Risk Management Act of 2021. Now you might think, well, we're in the UK, so what? A lot of um, UK tech companies exports to the US, and although this executive order is aimed at public sector procurement, what we're finding, so we, we've, we've got an office in the US, when, when this executive order came out, we, we were contacted by a lot, lot of software companies about they're going to adopt this regardless of whether they're selling to public sector. We've had dialogues with some well-known mainstream software vendors trying to get their head around about how do they enforce this on their suppliers, but also how do they manage the need for the software building materials uh, when they're delivering their software. So I would say this has been a real, real game changer in recent times, kind of forcing companies to to look at the risks. In the UK, there is a telecom security bill, um, which includes a provision for fines of up to £100,000 a day. And that also has a requirement for a software bill of materials. Uh, Cisco are the first company who supply a lot of infrastructure, telecoms infrastructure, you know, competing with Huawei. Um, so they've already stated and issued a document 
but they will provide a software bill of materials to any technology they deliver to UK UK public sector. Uh, and you, you can read the quote there from the cybersecurity advisor at Cisco. It says, you can't possibly buy a product because you, 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 you've, you've got maybe one version of an out-of-date component like OpenSSL. It could be Modernizer, which British Airways had. It might not be vulnerable, but it's out-of-date, therefore it must be bad. Therefore, what, why would you buy that technology? So increasingly, commercially for software suppliers or software solution providers, is they actually won't be able to sell their solutions unless they can demonstrate control around the use of open source in their software development. In the fintech space, and the UK has a very buoyant fintech industry, uh, the payment card industry, so this is PCI compliance, you're probably familiar with PCI DSS, so um, companies taking credit cards in e-commerce solutions, uh, Visa and MasterCard Amex uh, only allow that if the company's PCI DSS conformance. In 2009, they issued a, a new standard aimed at software developers developing solutions that have to be PCI conformance. Um, so it's a secure software lifecycle framework. And you can see I've highlighted some of the items in the testing requirements. You have to have an inventory of open source components that have to be vetted. You have to be able to identify if they're vulnerable and also have a strategy for remediating those vulnerabilities as, as they occur. So any software company you know, developing uh, e-commerce solutions that have to be PCI compliant, they have to be conformant with this standard. Um, in the, I know we've left the EU, but um, a lot of companies are still selling to the EU in the UK. Um, they've brought out a number of guidance documents uh, which are becoming mandates. So IoT, which is a big industry, um, that they've issued guidelines for securing IoT devices. Uh, the common theme again, uh, they should be able to generate software bill of materials, uh, identify open source components, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, blah blah blah, like like um, all the other standards we've talked about. Similarly, in the cloud space, another big sector. They brought out a, a secure uh, cloud services framework. And you can see the quotes on the screen, um, uh, show documents and implement policies for the use of third party open source software. That's, that's aimed at the software developers developing those cloud solutions. So increasingly across Europe, if you're not developing to those standards, you'll find it increasingly hard to actually sell your solutions into into that market and only only um, uh, on the 22nd they, they issued a publication related to ip strategy so it wasn't specifically about software intellectual property it was a broad ip as a as a growth economy across europe and they did a swot analysis they interviewed a lot of um, business owners and ip creators and a big thing that came out of it is uh, the view that there is a risk of lost revenue by incorrectly using uh, open source license components, uh, which might have the copyleft obligations that Holly referred to, which would completely devalue the company's intellectual property because they're forced to share it and lack of control around that. So it's becoming a, a bigger and bigger fo focus area. Now we mentioned, um, we both mentioned that uh, we do a lot of uh, open source audits to support due diligence. So we work with some legal firms, with, with some investors, and we work with companies buying other companies. Um, I've, I'm yet to come across a target organisation who can provide a software bill of materials or a breakdown of open source uh, immediately. Uh, it usually takes two weeks for a disclosure, and it's generally a manual exercise. And a, a recent um, exercise, you know, the CTO head of development said it took them two weeks. All their developers on it on the task two weeks to compile, manually compile what open source is in their code, and then we did a report 
and they only uncovered a quarter of what we uncovered. Um, and that's not uncommon. And the other thing which I, I kind of touched on is a common thing that we hear is well, we don't use open source in our software development. And I can hand on heart say the only area where I've seen that to be the case is in the embedded software for cars. So a German manufacturer avoid open source in like the engine management systems. And I've seen it in the defense sector for firmware for missiles. Other than that, uh, open source is used in all software development. Now, I'm just going to share with you, um, this was a recent audit. This was the initial findings, e-commerce solution. We um, did a deep dive into the code. We, we can look at uh, if a developer's copied and pasted code and stripped out the copyright and license information so we could do code snippet matching. Anyway, we identified 177 vulnerabilities, 29 critical, 103 high. So from a security perspective, you know, the cloud solution they're delivering could be another British Airways. So uh, that's a question mark for the investor. And then on the licensing IP side of things, 27 different open source licenses. And as Holly talked about with the spectrum, not all open source is equal. Uh, so there's different obligations when on licenses. You've got 27 varieties of open source licenses, 53 copyright statements. So there's 53 uh, other, other, other companies or people's copyright within the code. None of the license obligations were met. They, uh, the solution was based on Elasticsearch, which Holly touched on at the end of her presentation. So Elasticsearch is widely used in cloud developments. And as Holly said, they used to have this free open source version under the Apache license. So developers could just take it. All they have to do is give attribution, and they never did that typically. Um, and they changed their license to server-side public license, or you buy a commercial license. And the server-side public license isn't just about sharing the code of your application. The obligation is to share the code of the whole solution stack. So if you're putting something in the cloud, you would have backup solutions, security solutions, and things like that. The, it's actually documented in the license that you have to share the source code of everything associated with the solution which in many cases is impossible because a lot of those backup solutions and security solutions that could be proprietary. So the only choice for you is to buy the commercial license. Now, what's happened with Elasticsearch, it was this activity was, they felt AWS in particular and Microsoft with Azure were abusing the Apache license and it was affecting their revenue streams. So uh, they implemented this server-side public license as a reaction to that, Amazon what's called forked the last open source version of Elasticsearch and created a whole new distribution uh, based on that source code. So in the due diligence exercise, this, this caused the delay. So the discussions were, do we buy the commercial license? We haven't budgeted for that. Um, and we don't know the direction Elasticsearch is going in and it takes away some of our freedoms. Uh, do we stick on the version the last version under Apache, which they could do, but then you're accumulating technical debt. You know, going forward, you won't get any updates where you have to code the updates yourself. Or the third option is go down the Amazon route and use their fork, but you don't know what Amazon are going to do with the fork. So it, it, it caused serious, um, serious issues. And like Holly said, you know, it, it delayed decisions. And this scenario is typical of audits that we do in due diligence. Now, because it, because of all the issues that Ollie talked about and I've talked about so far, there is now fortunately some guidance and best practice uh, of how software companies should implement a process for managing this and also be able to demonstrate that externally to uh, customers, investors, or whatever the scenario might be. So a project started uh, probably around 2014-15, maybe, maybe uh, actually probably 2016, called OpenChain, 
Um, the open refers to open source and the chain refers to supply chain of software. So as we've talked about, modern software development is very much a supply chain where developers are pulling in components and you ship software downstream to customers. Uh, so you've got a supply chain of software. So open chain was born because there was no best practice or guidance for software companies. So a lot of companies with, with a vested interest who already develop and have an open source strategy. So companies like some of the car manufacturers like Toyota, uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, Facebook, Uber, all have their own individual processes for managing open source and trying to be compliant with licenses, came together to standardize the approach. And so Open Chain was born. And then at the end of last year, Open Chain was ratified as an ISO standard. So if a software company invests in time and resource in controlling open source, they can actually get a badge, they can get an ISO standard, and it's part of the quality assurance. And it has a commercial benefit. You know, if you're competing with a similar solution, features similar, price similar, but you're the only one with an open source strategy, then arguably the quality control of your software is better than you, you, the competitors and you probably win the deal. And we have, we have seen that happen. So some of the members, I touched on some of them, um, very big in auto. So average car today, over 100 million lines of code, a lot of that is open source. So there's a big presence from the car manufacturers like BMW, um, you know, Microsoft, who you, you, you probably wouldn't think of as an open source company, but actually I'll give you some stats on how much open source they use. You know, the chip manufacturers like ARM, Qualcomm, um, and uh, Toshiba, Sony, Siemens, and there's, there's, there's quite a significant representation across the industry. There's also uh, a legal uh, contribution. So a lot of legal firms who um, advise companies on open source and do a lot of due diligence, uh, you no doubt recognize a lot of the names on there. So there is a kind of subgroup of uh, legal companies who contribute to the development of the standard and adopting it. And one of, one of the goals, incidentally, of Open Chain is to ease and speed up due diligence related to open source and software development. So if, if a company's open chain conformance, this issue about creating a software bill of materials should be a straightforward exercise. In fact, it should be a click of a button to get the latest software bill of materials. Now, um, how is this being applied? So it's relatively new, but already we're seeing evidence of it being used in, in um, for software companies to, to demonstrate quality in their code and take away the fears of customers. So we've got a customer who developed for the NHS, a company called Interneuron, relatively small company. Um, they've open sourced uh, some of their technology and they are conformant with Open Chain. We, we actually have a case study on the Open Chain website. It's a big investment for them, but they are adamant that they have won business, uh, significant business, so over a million uh, pounds to develop software open source because they've got that level of control. So it's building trust in their technology. We've seen it used in due diligence. Now the thing about due diligence, if anybody on the call has been involved in this, it's a, it's a static point in time exercise. So we get asked to do an audit and the uh, target will provide us access to their source code and we audit it. But the reality of software development today is there's, there's daily or even hourly builds of software. So the software's code is changing all the time. So if you do a static bill of materials, it doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of the software, you know, the next day or the next week. And if you remediate the issues, you haven't fixed the underlying problem. What we have seen is some investors put in their terms of investment. Um, we will invest. And one of the conditions is you have to adopt open chain, ISO 5230, uh, within a time frame of the investment, so three to six months. Um, so then we support those organizations through that. Uh, and like I said, it should help with faster decision making because 
the production of building materials is easier. And actually, if you've got a process in place for tracking and managing it, you are a lower risk anyway. But another interesting area, which is kind of related to you know, that executive order, but we're seeing this across the world, is corporate procurement are now looking for evidence that open source is controlled in whatever solutions are being uh, sold into their organizations. So it's trusting their supply chain, vetting suppliers and IT solutions. And it's not just small tech companies. Um, uh, I had a call with Microsoft's uh, legal counsel and they told me that uh, in their standard enterprise agreements, they get uh, requests for clauses to include indemnity against not complying with open source obligations. And uh, as is the case with most big companies, they hate doing bespoke uh, bespoke contracts. So that drove them down the open chain route, actually, which I'll, I'll talk about. As, as an example, I mentioned the amount of software in cars. So Scania, who are very actively involved in open chain, uh, they're part of the VW group v and uh, Volkswagen are very active and following suit in what Scania are doing. So they've, they've come out with a statement. A lot of the software in the auto industries is third party developed. So they will commission uh, companies who specialize in auto software to develop solutions for the cars, things like the infotainment system and so on and so on. Now they have said there's three requirements if you want to supply software to Scania. You have to be conformant with open chain. So you've got a process for managing supply chain. If uh, a developer modifies open source components, they've got to share the modifications. And invariably, uh, open source components do get modified in order to make them work in whatever solution they're in. And the final piece, which is again, this common theme about software building materials, you have to provide a software building materials to Scania, um, version controlled, time stamped, et cetera. So every time a new piece of software is supplied, there should be a brand new software building materials. Now we, we, are, we are seeing uh, quite a lot of corporate procurements uh, going down this road. Um, and so in, in due diligence, part of due diligence is the commercial viability of a solution. And you can look at the risk of open source, you, know, you can look at security, you can look at compliance, but if lack of management of open source is going to affect your ability to sell your solution to big corporates, then obviously not managing open source make, makes it a commercial risk as well. Um, so I mentioned uh, I had this conversation with Microsoft. So Microsoft were early adopter of open chain and a guy called David Ruddin, who's one of their legal counsel in, in Redmond, he actually did all the work to convert open chain into an ISO standard. So I had a call with him about, you know, why, why, did, he, why did he do that and, and what why is it a motivation? And it was, like I said, they were, they were getting these requirements from customers for clauses about indemnification, about open source license um, misuse and so on and so on. So what they do now, so they've adopted open chain. If you, you can look at the Microsoft website, they've disclosed all the open source components and the code in a big repository. You can filter on any Microsoft products, Windows, SQL, Microsoft Office, Xbox, and it will tell you all the open source components that have been used in that particular solution, including copyright holders, including the license notices, and that is their uh, investment in complying with open source licenses. But the thing about having clauses in procurement licenses is they now say we're open chain conformance. If we miss something, we've got a strategy to fix it, so we don't need to do bespoke terms. Um, so quoted in their press release or, or this blog post about their open chain conformance, he said they use 150,000 components. He told me it's closer to 300,000 components. Um, and you, 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 like I said at the beginning, you know, this isn't just about open source companies. This is about companies developing whatever technology solution. They will be using open source components in their code. 
and it's becoming a, a bigger focus to demonstrate management of open source. So with that, um, I, I did see a question coming through. Uh, are there any questions, Holly? Yeah, so do you have any English litigation examples of open source enforcement? Well, okay. um, oh, Martin, do you want to... No, go on, go on, no, go on. Um, I will say, so there has not been an open source enforcement case that has made it to the English court yet. However, this is, is not to say that enforcement is not happening in the UK. The reality is the global practice, there is not a question about an open source licenses enforceability. So enforcement and compliance is happening before the um, the case in question does actually get filed to court. Where, so... Um, I know that Martin's been involved in many projects where enforcement's taken place. I think he's had experiences where disgruntled operating in the UK, disgruntled developers have left an organisation who then, um, because of their personal feelings, will then go where report non-compliance to the open source project and enforcement's happened that way. I'm not sure, Martin, if you have yeah. anything to do with that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's worth, worth saying as well. So, so we mentioned an organisation called the Software Freedom Conservancy. That, uh, you can equate those. They're a bit like um, what Firestar to, you know, proprietary software, where a develop a disgruntled developer, like Holly mentions, um, if they're frustrated with companies basically taking open source code and then not meeting obligations and, and deliberately so, they can approach the Software Freedom Conservancy. Software Freedom Conservancy is a non-profit like FAST, and it's made up of lawyers who are open source specialists, and they can take the case up on the behalf of the developers if they see that fit. But an example that we were drawn into is very similar to the Ghost Script stories, a similar kind of licensing model. Um, so a, a, a company develops a solution which they sold in the insurance space. And one of the developers left the company and went to work for the customer, uh, who's an insurance company. On it, on their first day, they said, um, oh, you know, they use this component in the code and they're not licensed it properly. So the customer contacted the software uh, copyright holder behind the open source um, technology and it triggered an audit uh, we were advising the software company and it was quite a drawn out process. It cost them a lot of money and distraction to their business. We've seen a lot of um, those sorts of threats happening, although no actual litigation cases yet. <laughs> but we have so seen them in, in Europe and Germany. Another question, Martin. How often do you find copyleft components in audit? Um, I would say um, 80 to 90 percent of audits is copy left and quite often it's um, so the thing with software developments um, it's, it's called dependencies where you take a component of say github and bring it into your code but when you compile the software to run it will pull in some more open source uh, so they're, they're named in the code but they're not physically present in the code in the source code and we've we found um, copyleft components getting pulled in as dependencies. So the, so the company's kind of blind to the fact uh, GPLs come into their code. And related to that question, uh, another question that I get asked is, well, how would anybody know? Um, when, Holly, you were showing the Jide story, there was a screenshot of um, uh, reference to the GPL. That was the installer. So when you run the installer for Jide, it referenced some of the licenses in the code. So you get things like that. There's also tools called binary analysis tools, which will um, break down a, a like executable, uh, so compile code, and it will look for text related to open source licenses. So the Software Freedom Conservancy actually um, use binary analysis tools when a developer's come to them and said, this company's not sharing their code and um, you know the, 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 it triggers a whole activity and threats of uh, legal action like the Donald Trump <laughs> scenario. So a final question here Martin, where is the best place for a tech company to start managing open source? 
Yeah, I think I think um, as a reference point, Open Chain, they've got a lot of reference material. Uh, generally, we find lack of knowledge or inconsistent knowledge or misconceptions about open source. So training, so we, we've got a, a training course, for instance, which is relevant to business people, business owners, developers, assumes no knowledge. Just get everybody on a level playing field of knowledge and then you can build a strategy going forward. That would be my recommendation. Great, thank you for that. And then we'll hand back over to Dawn, I believe. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you for listening. Yes, and uh, I just wanted to thank the, the speakers for those expert talks and also Source Code Control for co-hosting this seminar. And thanks to all attendees uh, for coming along today. Uh, a reminder that the recording and the slides will be circulated afterwards. Please do fill in the feedback form and don't forget to contact us um, when you, at the contact details given in the feedback form if you want more information about uh, myself for Fast Flag membership uh, or uh, indicate if you want a call from source code control if you have further specific confidential queries that you were unable to ask about today on the public chat. Uh, if you need their help. Um, uh, we hope to have physical meetings again next year and I'll be pleased to see you in person then. Uh, in the meantime, please enjoy the rest of your day.